All right, thank you all um, for coming, and I'm really excited, and thank you for inviting me to speak. So, as was mentioned, I'm going to be talking about biomarkers of aging, and it was already kind of stated why we need these biomarkers of aging. So there's a number of different therapies um, and interventions that are coming out that basically are aimed at slowing or intervening in the aging process. However, our ability to actually evaluate these different therapies and optimize them will depend on whether we can actually define the problem we're trying to solve, which in this case is aging. So a very important question is, what is aging and how do we measure it? Um, so we know for most um, model systems that we actually typically use uh, life expectancy or all-cause mortality to assess whether we've had an impact in the aging process. So we do an intervention, compare uh, control uh, to the intervention group, and see if we increase either median or maximum um, life expectancy. However, as you can imagine, uh, that creates quite a bit of difficulty if we're actually trying to do this in humans who have quite long life expectancies, and if we are actually going to increase them life expectancy much further, it becomes nearly impossible to do this. So, as I mentioned, morbidity and mortality outcomes may not be feasible due to time constraints if we're actually going to try and do some of these interventions earlier in the life course before um, major pathologies have really taken hold. So this is really one of the number one reasons why we need uh, what we consider biomarkers of aging or measures of biological age. So we think of these as maybe useful proxies that can be used for evaluating these different interventions. Um, so I've tried to come up with a list of um, goals of what might make a good uh, biomarker of aging. So number one, uh, we'd like it to be minimally invasive, otherwise people probably won't be involved in your trial. Um, it should track with chronological time. For measuring aging, it should increase with age. Um, we would like something to be a continuous variable. Um, we know aging is a spectrum. Hopefully, it will be responsive to intervention. This is kind of where we are um, with the current biomarkers of aging. We've developed them. We can show they track with chronological age, but we actually haven't had that much evidence yet on whether they're responsive to different interventions that people are coming up with. And you should actually be able to monitor them um, in real time and in short time frames and actually see change within a short window of time. So today I'm going to mainly be talking about DNA methylation and how we make uh, different biomarkers of aging from that. And many of you in the room probably have already heard of what we call epigenetic clocks. Um, so basically, just really quickly to go over DNA methylation if you're not familiar with it. Um, if we think of the genome and we look uh, from 5' prime to 3' prime end, um, you have these regions um, called CPG dinucleotides. So basically a cytosine followed by a guanine, and these cytosines can become methylated. And usually, although we don't understand the complexity of this per se, uh, this methylation will uh, regulate gene transcription. And so what we actually have done, and probably most of you know Steve Horvath, who I was actually postdoc in his lab, is we've used measures of DNA methylation across the genome, so at hundreds to thousands of sites to actually predict what, um, chronological age measures and use these as proxies for uh, measures of biological or what we call epigenetic age. So there's the Horvath clock, which many of you have heard of. Um, however, what you might not be familiar with is that there's actually over a dozen different epigenetic clocks. Um, so the first one was discovered in 2011. It's actually not the Horvath clock, although he was part, he was an author on this paper. Um, and there's new ones being developed every day. I get asked to be a reviewer constantly on new uh, epigenetic clocks. Um, but the thing that we're actually finding really interesting is there's very poor agreement between these epigenetic clocks. So um, something we're really interested in my lab is actually trying to decompose a signal and understand what some of them are capturing compared to others, and then can we use that information to develop even better clocks. So in this case, I'm showing uh, three epigenetic clocks, so the Horvath clock, um, our newer clock, which some of you might know by the name of the PhenoAge clock, and then Hanum, which was the one that came out the same year as the Horvath clock, but was in whole blood. So this is the number of CPGs that are shared between these clocks. Um, so as you can see, there's very little overlap. 
This even holds when we look at um, bigger genomic regions, so it's not just that you're getting the CPG right next to the other one within the same island. Um, and then this shows the correlation between these uh, three clocks after you regress, regress out the effect of chronological age. So it's only about a 0.4 to 0.5 correlation between these clocks. So they really are capturing some different information. And uh, the same thing holds when we actually look at their prediction of different uh, age-related outcomes. Uh, so in blue, uh, this is the Horvath clock, and it does really well at predicting age in multiple different tissues. Part of this is because it was trained as a multi-tissue age clock. Um, whereas our newer clock is a better predictor of things like smoking status, time till death when assessed in blood, BMI, et cetera, because of the way we trained it to be more of a health span, lifespan uh, predictor. And then the Hannum clock is kind of a hybrid of the two clocks. So a goal in our lab, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, this is preliminary ongoing work, but I'm kind of trying to give you an idea of kind of where we hope the field is going, is to really decompose these signals and also get a better idea of what the clock is actually capturing, and in doing that, actually making hallmark-specific clocks. So not ones that are basically um, kind of a grab bag of tons of different processes that we don't actually understand what's going into them. So in talking about uh, decomposing these different clocks, um, you can actually think of it as a clock. There's tons of different pieces, so there's a bunch of different phenomenon in aging even at the epigenetic level that is happening, and the clocks are probably picking up all of that, although to different proportions. So again, uh, there's very little overlap between the clocks, so out of about 1,600 CPGs across all the clocks that I showed in that um, kind of timeline picture, uh, a little over 14 are unique to just one clock. Um, and there's also very little overlap in the signals. So what we think is happening is that there's actually various types of CPGs that are differentially distributed across these different clocks. So we've done some work um, with network analysis, trying to cluster these into different modules, and then from there look at what functionally what they're related to. Um, so for this, we um, use multi-tissue uh, data, so data from six different types of samples. So fibroblasts, epidermis, blood, so whole blood, colon, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, so brain, and uh, buccal swabs. And we use what's called a weighted network analysis to find these conserved signals so, or conserved networks of CPGs across these six different tissue types. Um, so this, you don't have to worry about understanding this figure, but generally what we do is we get this network. Um, and the, these different colors represent the different uh, networks of CPGs. Each little line going down is a CPG. And they get clustered into these different colors. And these colors represent the age correlations for each CPG in these different tissues. So what you can see here is that the ones in this uh, turquoise are ones that have high positive age correlations, regardless of which tissue we are looking at. So next what we actually did is, so we have all the CPGs, we know which cluster they're in, which we're denoting by color, is we can look at the relative proportions in the different clocks to see if actually the difference with the clocks is that they're picking up these different modules in different um, frequencies. So gray represents CPGs that are not in a network, so they're unassigned to a module. So as you can see, there's some clocks that have a lot of these unassigned ones, which we think are ones that are just not conserved across the different tissues. Um, but even if we get rid of the gray and we look at the distributions of these different modules, we see very different patterning. Um, ironically, we were surprised at uh, the original Horvath clock and our new pheno age clock, which we think of as fairly different in terms of its associations with outcomes, actually have almost exactly the same kind of distribution of these different networks. Whereas the Hannah clock is quite different. The Yang clock, which is considered mitotic clock, is uh, the most distinct. So then what we can do is we can say, what if we just take the CPGs that were in the blue module, for instance, in the Horvath clock, and just and set all the rest of them to zero and just get that part of the Horvath clock and see if this part of the Horvath clock is capturing the same thing as this part of the Levine clock or this, it, blue's not in Hannum, but maybe this part of Horvath 2 clock. And we, then we can actually see, are they picking up the same signals or different signals? And I'm just gonna show quickly two examples of that. Um, so there's one of these modules, uh, this turquoise module where basically the piece of each clock 
from the turquoise module is highly correlated across the clocks. So this is a conserved signal all the clocks are picking up. On the other hand, this pink one is really distinct. So three of the clocks are picking up the same signal, but interestingly, three of the clocks are actually picking up the inverse. So this is inversely weighted in these clocks. So we can also look at them um, in terms of these are correlations with chronological age. This is that turquoise um, cluster, <coughs> excuse me, that I showed before in multiple different tissue types. And basically these plots for uh, the Horvath 1 and 2, Hanum and Levine, are almost indistinguishable. So again, this signal is conserved across all the clocks. Um, whereas this was the one that wasn't, and as you can see, we get very different patterning with age for these four different clocks for this one. So what we're doing now is actually going in and looking at functional associations to figure out what these different pieces of the clocks are, and then we're also retraining new clocks using the pieces to see which pieces are, maybe one um, module is the best predictor, what's driving the um, mortality uh, association, whereas another one might be driving, might be picking up the multi-tissue age association, for instance. So the other thing we're doing is actually trying to start from scratch, and instead of figuring out what functional processes are in the existing clocks, making clocks specifically to capture different hallmarks of aging. Um, so we're actually starting uh, with cellular senescence, and part of this is because there seems to be a precedent with uh, senolytics coming out to have a really good biomarker of senescence. Of course, there are um, biomarkers people are using of senescence, but um, there's some, there's some um, issues with how valid they might be for um, some of these clinical trials. So our question was, is there a DNA methylation uh, fingerprint of senescence? Because we know that uh, cellular senescence actually has a big um, impact on the epigenome. Uh, so for this, we used um, cell culture to actually train this data. So we had mesenchymal stromal cells, um, human uh, fibroblasts, and um, embryonic stem cells for validation. And we have different conditions in the first two. So we had um, our control cells, which were the early passage cells. We also had cells that underwent uh, replicative senescence, um, ionizing radiation in the mesenchymal stromal cells. And we also, for comparison, had immortalized cells and um, induced pluripotent stem cells. And then in the fibroblasts, again, we had replicative senescence. We had uh, cells that were passage until they were near senescent. Um, but we're still proliferative. And then we had oncogene-induced senescence using HRAS retrovirus. And then again, for comparison, immortalized and immortalized transformed cells. Um, so first what we did is we just compared the methylation profiles of these different cell types. So we used a technique called TSNE, which is similar to a PCA, although nonlinear. And basically what we can see is that we get very different clustering for the different cell types this is based on their methylation pattern across 450,000 CPG sites. Um, so that gave us kind of a good um, idea that this is actually, we actually should be able to pick up a, a signature that differentiates these types of cells. Um, so then we use a supervised machine learning approach where we basically compare, we pool this, uh, the samples, so we're comparing these red samples to the blue samples. And basically what we end up with is a new epigenetic marker that includes 88 CPGs that were selected. Um, and they're pretty evenly distributed across the genome, as you can see here. So when we actually apply this measure and we can compare uh, the cells, what we find is uh, the early passage cells have really low prediction on this, what we're calling DNAM send measure, whereas all the cells that uh, are positive for SA beta gal have uh, high measures near one. And um, this is, some of these were not in our training data, so this um, serves the validation. And you actually can't even see the embryonic stem cells and the induced pluripotent stem cells. They're so low on this measure. So then the next question is, can we actually observe any signal from this measure in samples from individuals? Um, so we looked at whole blood and whether this was correlated with chronological age. And again, we found a pretty robust correlation about 0.5 between our DNA and the SEND measure and chronological age. Um, this is basically the same data but plotted in different age groups. After adjusting for chronological age, we also find um, a, that it's associated with IL-6, which is part of the SAS um, profile. We find 
that individuals with slower walking speed um, have higher uh, senescence according to our methylation measure. Uh, we find moderate association with cognitive functioning in the small sample, and then also a fairly robust association with a previous kind of organismal biological age measure that we developed called phenoage. Um, finally, we also looked at data from um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is um, one of the diseases that are actually being used in some of the senolytic trials. And again, we, for this, we actually had data from the lung sample, and we find that um, normal lungs relative to IPF lungs have lower um, measures on this DNA enzyme. So in conclusion, basically, um, <clears throat> excuse me, DNA methylation can capture various um, aging phenomenon and or hallmarks, <clears throat> but that's part of the problem in these clocks is that we actually think it's capturing kind of a whole grab bag. So functionally understanding what they are is going to be a problem, and we need to kind of decompose them to be able to do that. But we think that in applying them in a more meaningful way to test interventions and or they can, they can be applied in a more meaningful way to test interventions and or discover mechanisms of differential aging rates. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, so with that, I just want to acknowledge my lab, who are the people who are doing a lot of this work, and also my funding um, from NIA and the Glenn Foundation, and I'm happy to take any questions if we're doing questions.